Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Gabe's to here. This is the guide for Fell Lord Zakun. And as always, this is for normal and heroic, but the footage is for heroic itself. Uh, this fight is actually quite simple. Uh, there are not very many mechanics going on. Overall, it's not too difficult. Shouldn't take your raid too much time compared to some of the other bosses that are around uh, this stage in the zone. Uh, the real difficulty comes in with um, communication for the most part. This is a fight that really emphasizes the need for voice communication, which I think is pretty standard fare for pretty much any organized raid group these days, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, but you kind of need one or a handful of people to uh, communicate very quickly on certain events during the fight to make sure things are handled properly. But for the majority of the raid, uh, this is really quite basic. You're not really doing a whole lot throughout the fight. So let's get started. So the primary mechanic in this fight is waves of destruction, which will spawn from various locations throughout the fight based on certain events we'll get to in a moment. And when these waves interact with other uh, mechanics in the fight, they can sometimes cause unleashed uh, energy explosions. And these explosions are just a raid-wide uh, damage hit that deal pretty heavy fire damage, uh, around 100,000 damage or so, a little more on heroic, and you know obviously less than that on normal. Uh, but the basic goal of the fight is, since you're only really dealing with the boss, it's about positioning and dealing with the waves that come out at various moments and blocking them uh, using players that are safe to do so, so that they do not negatively in impact other targets and therefore cause the unleashed explosions. So that's the overall goal of the entire fight. Uh, stop waves from hitting people or objects that you want to avoid. So the first mechanic you'll really deal with in this fight is rumbling fissures. And uh, this is cast twice per basic phase. We'll get into phases in a moment. When this uh, actually casts, the boss will spawn four green pools in random locations around the room. You can see them kind of in the corners of the screen. Uh, the way these pools work is they sort of have a, a cast time or a you know, wind-up period, uh, during which time a player can step into the pool to absorb the energy and prevent a pillar from spawning. Uh, the goal is that the fishers themselves are trying to spawn a pillar, so if any player is not standing in the pool when it completes its warm-up cast period, it will spawn a pillar, as you see to the left there. However, uh, if a player is standing in every pool, in all four of the fissures that spawned, a fissure uh, pillar will spawn anyway. You cannot prevent the minimum of one pillar from spawning in each set. So because of this knowledge, you actually want to control where the pillar appears, uh, based on, of course, the four random locations, by only soaking three out of the four pools. So there you can see we soaked the back left, the back right and the front right pool for my position and left the front left one that was to the left of me there uh, open toward the blue marker in this case. So here we're doing the same thing. We're soaking the ones that are not near the existing pillar so that we force the pillar to pop up near the other one. So this is the overall goal for the raid to handle these fissures. You ideally want the pillars that spawn to appear in a designated location typically near other pillars because it will make um, dealing with them when it comes to the wave management a lot easier. Now the reason you need to control the pillar location is because if a wave of destruction from any source touches an existing pillar, it will cause an unleashed energy explosion. So I talked about how that comes from a few different sources. That's one of the ways you can cause an explosion. So once a pillar is active, it will be up for uh, the remainder of that sort of basic phase until the next um, for sort of phase transition occurs and you get some more pillar spawns and old ones will despawn. So for that reason, you want to put pillars in a location that allows you to protect them uh, as easy as possible from getting touched by waves that are created later in the fight. Now how you choose to spawn the pillars is obviously up to your raid, but generally speaking, the safest method is to try to get the pillars to spawn in a corner, as near a corner as possible. And this is just because of basic geometry. If you, you know, base, on, base things on the assumption that the pillar can be threatened from a wave from any angle, 
Uh, if a pillar is dead in a corner, uh, then it is protected uh, for a 270 degree arc around it because of the two walls it's up against. It's, it's up against that corner. So that means the the uh, danger zone for the pillar getting touched by waves is only 90 degree arc, uh, which is you know quite small. Uh, next best thing, of course, is against any given wall. That's 180 degrees. Uh, it's still not as good as a corner, but you know that kind of thing. And it will never be this perfect. And they will never spawn dead in a corner like that. Um, plus, they're you know they have a, a radius of their own. So anyway, it's not exactly 90 degrees, but that's the general goal: push them towards the corner as much as possible. And this will protect them uh, using the walls more so than you'd be able to do if they were just in the middle of the room. So this is where communication is paramount. Uh, usually what our raid has found worked well is to kind of just pick a corner of the room as your predetermined pillar location. And that way, when you actually get the set that comes out and you see where the random locations are, uh, you can say, all right, that's, we're going to stick with that corner of the room and, you know, keep the pillar nearest to that area as the one that's going to spawn. So for us, that's always the blue marker, which is to the back left of tanks there. So when we start the fight, the first set of pillars that come out, uh, if there's one even remotely near that blue designation, we'll just use that as the spot. And then from then on, all future pillars, we try to get to spawn as near to that as possible. But again, you can adjust it on the fly based on where they're spawning at a given, any given moment and you know just communicate with the raid and say, all right, we're going to only soak this or leave this one up and soak all the others. Uh, usually you want to have at least one raid member that's in charge of sort of making that decision on the fly and calling it out. So as raid leader for our group, obviously I do that and I'll just say, all right, you know, ignore the, the one closest to red or something like that, or leave the one that's behind the tanks or whatever it is, you know, just quickly make that decision and call it out so that the raid can soak all the other locations and you'll get the spawn where you want it. Now, when a player soaks a pillar, they will gain latent energy. And this is applied to one pillar per fissure uh, that is soaked in any given fissure set. And it's only one player. So if you have two people in it, uh, that won't give them both the debuff. It'll just give one player the debuff. Uh, I'm fairly certain anyway. And this is applied at the end of the, the period uh, once it actually triggers. So... Latent energy itself, uh, just like a pillar, if a wave of destruction throughout the fight touches a player that's afflicted with latent energy, uh, they will explode, dealing the unleashed explosion damage, just as if a pillar was hit. So those are the two uh, targets that your raid needs to protect from not getting hit by waves throughout the fight. It's the pillars, waves can't touch pillars, and waves can also not touch a player that has soaked an a, a pillar recently and therefore already has latent energy on. So the way we found worked best to deal with latent energy is to have all the players with the latent energy debuff go to a designated location uh, in the room, somewhat near the pillars. And the reason to keep them near the pillars, of course, is just to limit the danger zone, so to speak, that's within the room where waves are, in, are a no-fly zone, where you don't want them to go. So if our pillars are toward blue, as they are in this clip here, the latent energy position is essentially just to the side of those, away from the boss, though. So it's at the yellow marker in, in our case. And these markers are not in any specific spot. We just threw all the markers around the room, so we have reference points to refer to throughout the fight. So we put our latent energy afflicted players toward the yellow marker, and this means that when a wave comes in from opposite them, for example, so say waves are coming from the, the silver marker or the red on the right, well, now they're effectively blocked from hitting the pillars by the tanks in front and the melee, um, since that's where the boss is tanked. And they're also blocking the players that are latent debuffed that are in that same angle, that are same direction. And the same kind of rule applies when waves are coming from other directions by keeping the pillars and the latent afflicted players somewhat close together, you're effectively killing two birds with one stone when waves come in from angles that are 
that need to be blocked. So throughout the remainder of the uh, mechanics that I go through, I will assume that your RAID is, is doing somewhat similar setup in that you have a designated position where latent energy players are, and that should be pretty close to pillars uh, so that you kind of get that two birds with one stone effect going on. So now that we know that a wave touching a pillar or a wave touching latent energy are the really things you have to avoid in this fight, let's talk about where waves come from. Uh, the first source, the primary source, really is the boss himself. He will cast cavitation fairly frequently, and when he does so, he will send out a series of waves. So here you can see, just repeating a clip of this, so you can see in action. Uh, what's critical about cavitation, the waves from the boss, is that when he sits, spawns these waves, they will emanate from his location in the direction of randomly selected raid members. And this is critical because this means you are absolutely free to tank the boss near a pillar, like you see here, because you know that a wave from the boss from cavitation will never go uh, in a direction that a player is not. So what this means is here, we can tank the boss right by the pillar, but because neither the tanks nor the melee in the back are ever positioning themselves between the boss and pillar location, a cavitation wave will never uh, go in that in that space. It will never go in that direction because it's not going toward a player location. The other critical thing about this ability is that it has a sort of dead zone to protect melee. So when it uh, is first created, when the set of waves is created, they spawn a few yards away from the boss. This means that when this ability goes off, melee players should get really close to the boss, just right up under him, and that will effectively force the waves to spawn behind their location so they'll never get hit by the actual uh, cast effect. The final thing to keep in mind is because these cavitation waves go toward random raid members, often it will select players that are afflicted with latent energy. Uh, so again, if you have your latent afflicted players all in one location, this makes protecting them fairly easy. So if you sort of look in the top left of the screen toward the yellow marker, you can see our monk healer there is standing between the boss and the uh, latent energy players that are behind him. And that way, if one of the players gets targeted by a cavitation wave, which they do, or at least someone in that direction does here, you can see that the wave gets blocked by the, the monk who's protecting those players he's in front. So this is a general good practice that you want to do throughout the fight is have one or two people assigned to effectively protecting the latent energy pack of players. Uh, so this means when cavitation is cast, there's someone between the boss and those players to make sure they soak the wave. And later on, when you get waves from other sources, they can also help soak those as well. So the other common way you'll see waves, and by far the most difficult ability in the entire fight, is Seed of Destruction. So this is cast during the second phase, the disarm phase. And when this goes off, it will debuff uh, a handful of random raid members. And these players will have a five second seed of destruction debuff. When this debuff expires, they will explode and send out eight waves of destruction at their current location. So uh, obviously you wanna prevent these waves from touching the pillars or latent energy players. So you need to move players with seed to areas around the room that are far from those locations. The best thing to do that we found is to have seed afflicted players run to you know opposite corners and opposite walls from the pillar and latent energy locations spread out from one another you can't be on top of each other because you will hit each other's waves when they spawn and be against walls of some kind so uh, you can see i'm just repeating a couple um, of these events going off here's a, a seed that's going out it's afflicting one of our druids who's got latent energy in the top left so he ran from the latent energy group up to the corner there which is near the green marker and when he detonated uh, he had the one or two people you know our monk from previously maybe someone else step between his location and the uh, location of the uh, latent energy group to soak the waves that are going to come toward them uh, for everyone else that doesn't have latent energy that gets seed, they just go to the opposite corners, as mentioned before, you know, away from the pillars, away from latent energy, spread out, 
And when they detonate, um, the majority of the ray that's kind of central can soak any waves that threaten to touch pillars or go toward the latent group. So overall, it's mechanically not that complicated. It's just important that everyone in the raid is able to quickly react and figure out where they need to go without too much delay. Uh, because this only occurs twice per disarm phase, you're not going to see it go off very much. So don't be afraid to have people use cooldowns and you know just stuff that effectively allows them to survive. Uh, you'll see that we have one death here in this first set. Our hunter that was off to the right, um, he's just made a foolish mistake. He had latent energy and he didn't go to the designated position. And so he just stood there, got hit by a wave, exploded, and uh, that was that. So you need to you know make sure everyone is aware that they need to be in specific locations based on their debuffs. And otherwise, if they're not debuffed with latent energy, uh, actively help block the waves. When a wave touches you, it does do damage to the afflicted player as well as anyone within three yards. So it's a very small radius. Um, so usually for the most part, it's not going to be dangerous if multiple people try to soak the same wave, you know, as long as they're not stacked on top of each other, which is difficult to do. So let's talk about the two different phases. As mentioned, these will alternate back and forth until the boss is dead. And you start off with the armed phase. Uh, during the armed phase, the boss will do the Fisher's ability, Remeline Fisher's, twice. He will also cast Cavitation, as mentioned before. In addition to that, he has a couple uh, different abilities, one of which is Foul, which will debuff a random raid member with the Befouled debuff, and this is essentially a Healing Absorb. Uh, however, the way this works is when the Heal Absorb uh, is fully complete, when it absorbs all the healing that it's going to maximally hold, it will cause the player to explode uh, for pretty heavy damage in a six yard radius. So this is the primary reason that raid members should try to be spread on this fight. And there's really no other reason that you need to be spread, uh, but it does help you automatically by you know, spreading out your soaking capabilities for waves that come out just by being spread naturally. And because you don't want to be stacked up for if Befouled is on you, this will help with that too. But beyond that, if you do have Befouled, just try to get away from other people uh, before it is actually healed to full and you explode. The last ability you'll see on the arm phase is Soul Cleave, and this is cast on the tank only. And you can see the current tank is sent into a Shadow Realm. Uh, this realm is just basically dealt with by the tanks only. No one else has to worry about it at all in Normal and Heroic. And it's quite simple. Uh, it's basically like a mild bullet hell style thing. The tank has to dodge a series of waves. And as the fight progresses and you go in a second time and a third time and so on, uh, you will also have to jump over rings of destruction, which you see are spawning there. The way the rings appear is that when a tank exits the realm, which is just based on a timer that will expire, uh, when they exit, they will spawn a nether or i think it's residual energy orb at their location and that orb will persist throughout the remainder of the fight but it's only in the shadow realm when another tank goes in another time the orbs will then uh, spawn or emanate these rings of destruction that have to be jumped over top of by the tanks so as the fight progresses and tanks go in more and more uh, you will have to jump over more and more of these rings because they're more and more uh, energy orbs active in that realm. All that said, it's a very, very easy mechanic. And again, only the tanks have to worry about it. Uh, it does not seem to affect the raid that's outside in any way at all. So if a tank uh, gets hit by something in here, it only affects the tank in the Shadow Realm. And the only thing that actually impacts the raid at all is when the tank exits, uh, he or she will spawn a set of eight Waves of Destruction, and the normal realm from their location. So you can see in this clip, I'm just repeating how I'm going towards, you know, a back corner away from the uh, pillars and the latent energy group pretty much. And also communication helps as well. So I will announce to the raid, all right, you know, waves are coming from this raid marker location. And when I exit in just a couple seconds. Uh, beyond that though, there's just 
I don't know. It's it's just a weird mechanic. It doesn't even seem like it belongs. I think it's mostly just set up for Mythic where it actually matters more. Um, one thing to note, though, is if you are a tank and you get latent energy for some reason, you ideally wouldn't want it, but you absolutely can soak a pillar if you're a tank. There's no real reason that you cannot. Uh, just be aware that it will mean that if you get hit by a wave in the Shadow Realm, you will, you know, explode and take more damage on yourself but again it should only affect you anyway uh, when you exit this realm you will have your latent energy removed so if you do have latent energy going in there uh, just survive until the end of it and when you pop out you'll be fine again so the other phase occurs when the boss throws his axe down at some location around the room and goes into his disarm phase during this period this is kind of when uh, the damage gets a little bit crazy, and you'll also have to deal with Seeds of Destruction. So the axe itself that's in the ground just emanates uh, explosion damage, fire damage to the entire raid. It's not reduced in any way by distance or anything like that, so just don't worry about it. Just do what you've been doing positionally. Uh, you just have to heal through the damage. For the tanks themselves, while the boss is disarmed in this phase, he will use heavy-handed uh, which is a common mechanic we've seen many other times. It effectively causes the boss to duplicate his attack on the primary target to the nearest uh, player uh, next to that person. So it means the tanks have to stack on one another. It also means that um, melee and other raid members, if they're not careful and they try to run somewhere to you know, soak a wave or something like that, uh, they could get too close to the tank and end up getting hit by heavy handed instead of the off tank. So be very careful about positioning uh, during this phase. This means for melee and tanks both, try not to move around too much if you can avoid it. Also, because the damage is so high and the phase is so short, it's a good idea to use cooldowns during this phase. You're going to have to deal with heavy-handed damage, the explosion damage from the axe, and the seed uh, damage from Seed of Destruction, which is used twice during this phase. Uh, all of that com combined is a lot of damage on everyone in the raid. So this is really the time to use your survival cooldowns. Um, and then you go back into the standard armed phase. You get a little bit of breathing time until the next disarm phase and the process repeats. So the last phase or pseudo phase is when the boss hits 30%, he will enrage. This will effectively mean he does everything from the first two phases combined. Uh, so, this is where you obviously burn, bloodlust, all your DPS cooldowns, all that stuff. Try to finish him off, still doing the mechanics as you normally would, but trying to kill him before he murders everybody. Uh, the main thing to keep in mind is that during this phase, even though he's still whittling a weapon, he will effectively use the heavy-handed cleave attack, so the tanks need to make sure they stay stationary. You can see there I'm moving a little bit, which is not good. Uh, I was trying to soak a wave. Um, but generally, you kind of need to leave that up to non-tank players, you know, and we've learned much better techniques since since this first kill here that you see in the footage. Um, beyond that, he will still use, you know, rumbling fissures, so you need to soak up all the pillars except the one that you're saving. He'll use cavitation. He will debuff players that need to be healed um, for befouled. Um, and Seed of Destruction also still goes off. So a lot of stuff happening in the last phase, and this is all the more reason that you really need to focus on the burning and pushing the boss down before he kind of ends you. So finally, to recap the tips for DPS on this fight, uh, for Rumbling Fissures, make sure you soak three out of the four pools, and that way the unsoaked pool will spawn the pillar in the location that your raid wants it in. When you get latent energy uh, after soaking a pool, Make sure you move to the designated posi position with other latent energy players. Uh, if you get Seed of Destruction, which is in the Disarm phase or the final 30% of the boss, make sure you move against a wall and toward the opposite walls away from existing pillars. That way, when you spawn waves, uh, people will have time to react and soak them up. Also, when that debuff is about to expire, make sure you do not move at all because you don't want to accidentally step into the waves that you're creating and instantly kill yourself. Uh, make sure you help to soak all the waves if you don't have latent energy on you already. 
And that way you can you know, prevent them from touching latent energy players or pillars uh, that they might be approaching. If you get befouled, make sure you stay spread at least six yards apart so that when the heal is uh, taken care of, you don't kill everyone. And if you're a melee player, when the boss uses cavitation, make sure you are very close to the boss, right up under him, so that the cavitation waves spawn behind you. For tank recap on this fight, uh, it's actually quite an easy encounter. Uh, make sure you tank the boss near uh, the outside edge of pillars that might exist and try to keep his side toward those pillars if at all possible. Um, the reason for keeping the side toward him is that if he decides to send a wave toward a tank during cavitation, it will not threaten to hit the pillar. Um, but same thing for other players as well. If, if a melee are behind the boss, and they get targeted with a cavitation wave, they will not be threatened um, by those either. Uh, when you get soul cleaved and sent into the other realm, uh, it's pretty simple. Make sure you dodge the waves. You can jump over the rings uh, once those start to appear and make your way toward a wall or corner that's opposite the existing pillar locations. And don't be afraid to warn your raid when you're about to pop out that a few waves are gonna come out in that location. Uh, other than that, make sure you stack tightly with the tank partner during the disarm phase or when the boss is below 30% health so that you both can soak the heavy-handed sort of cleave attack together. You'll also need to use very heavy cooldowns, personal mitigation during this period because you'll take a ton of damage. And finally, the recap for healers. Uh, you'll generally need to use big heal cooldowns for the disarm phase or once the boss reaches sub 30% and goes into his, his enrage phase. That's when the raid will be taking the majority of damage from seeds and of course on tanks due to the um, heavy handed effect. When you get rumbling fissures, make sure you soak three out of the four pools. Uh, healers are perfectly capable of doing this, although you don't want the entirety of your raid or healer team to have latent energy. So generally speaking, you should have a mix of ranged DPS and healers that do this. Uh, when you have Seed of Destruction, make sure you move out to a corner or a wall that's opposite existing pillars and away from other latent players. And when you're about to expire and this will explode, make sure you stand still. Uh, also, when you are soaking the waves that come in, make sure you only worry about the waves that are approaching latent energy or, uh, you know, the pillars themselves. And finally, if you get befouled on you, stay spread at least six yards when that's about to be healed up to full or just stay spread six yards at all times and you don't have to worry about it. So I believe that covers everything for Fell Lord Zakun, uh, normal and heroic. As always, good luck, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. So I had a dream last night where I was locked out of a hotel room, of course only in my underwear, and I look down the hall and I see you walking toward me. I try to avert my gaze, not look at you directly, but I can tell that you've seen me. And the shame is real, so all I can do is scream out, Please subscribe! <laughs>